There are two plants referred to as aloes in the Bible. One is a reference to a plant called aloe vera, and the other is agarwood, a rich fragrant resin formed in the heartwood of the aquilera or agarwood tree. The aloe vera plant does not produce an essential oil, but rather a gel similar to this one that's commonly used as a household item for soothing skin conditions such as sunburn. You probably have some in your medicine cabinet right now. It really serves a great purpose. But in this program, I want to take a closer look at argarwood, which produces a rich, costly essential oil in response to a natural parasite, fungal, or mold attack that is grown and produced in Vietnam. You're going to really enjoy watching this, so stay tuned to Rebecca at the Well. In this program, we'll be exploring the healing oils of ancient scripture, along with their powerful healing constituents. Okay, so today I want to talk about aloes in the Bible. Now, we talked about there being two different kinds, the aloe vera that we're all familiar with, and the argarwood, which is actually comes from the heartwood of the tree in response to a natural parasite or a fungal or mold attack. And this is a natural process that happens when the logs are buried in the ground and the outer part decays while the inner part is saturated with this resin. And so this takes a very long time to happen. In fact, they might even deliberately wound the tree to make it susceptible to this attack. And that way, the fungus and the deep, you know, decomposing process will take over. And it's actually over several hundred years as this process is making one of these most rare and costly essential oils that is on the planet today. It's very scarce as well and very costly. Actually, at the time of writing this book, when I was writing about Heal With Oil, and this is one of the oils in here, I saw on eBay that they had a piece of wood on um, you know, eBay for sale, and it was starting bid at $65,000. Can you believe that? Unbelievable. But now the second reference in the Bible of aloes is line aloes, mentioned in Balaam's blessing for Israel. In Numbers 24, 6, it says, and the valleys, they spread forth gardens by the riverside and on the trees, the lion aloes, which the Lord has planted as cedar trees beside the waters. And so this Arabic word aloes in this verse actually means little tents. And this is, of course, derived from the triangular shape of the capsules from the trees and its resin emits this fragrant spice. Now these little tents refer to uh, the tent on the housetop, this was considered a place of intimacy or the bridal tent. So it, it was a common practice in the Middle East where they would build this little honeymoon suite on top of the roof house or the rooftop of the house. In 2 Samuel 16, 22, it tells how they spread a tent on the top of the house for Absalom. And so this is mentioned in Song of Solomon 4.14, as well as in Proverbs 7.17. There was that theme of aloes referring to this place of intimacy. It says, I have preferred, uh, perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Now in the New Testament, we see aloes is only referenced once as a burial spice in preparing Yeshua's body after his crucifixion. This rare fragrance employed is referenced in John 19, 39, and it says, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. And so this intimacy again, plays into this very tender story. Just before his death, Yeshua, who was like an Israeli bridegroom, comforted his disciples with those words as saying, just as a, a bridegroom would say, that he was going away to prepare a place for his bride. And he says it would be in his father's house. It's mentioned in the book of John, the Gospel of John 14, verse one and two. It says, let not your heart be troubled. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And just like in the ancient 
times when the betrothal ceremony, the bridegroom would leave the bride's house, return to his father's house to prepare for the wedding day. And of course, before departing, he would make this promise that he was going to be going away, but he would come back for her. It says, I go and prepare a place for you, and when it's ready, I will return for you. So it's during this time of separation, the groom is building on his bridal chamber or tent, which would have been attached to the father's house, while the bride now is gathering all her treasures and wonderful things in her trousseau and making herself ready for his return.